Evening, South Africa slipped into a recession after figures from StatsSA showed that the economy contracted by 0.7% in the first quarter of this year, this after shrinking by 0.3% in the fourth quarter of last year. This is the first recession for the country since 2009. The largest negative contributor to the weak GDP number was the trade, catering and accommodation industry. The manufacturing industry also saw a sharp decline, contracting by 3.7%. The only sectors that managed growth were agriculture and mining. The National Treasury says Finance Minister Malusi Kigaba will be seeking a meeting with business leaders soon to discuss ways of working together to achieve inclusive economic growth. Let's dive right into a discussion of what all of this means to you and I. We are joined in the studio by economist and CEO of Pan-African Investment Services, Dr. Iraj Abedian. And we also have South African Federation of Trade Unions General Secretary, Zuelinzi Mavavi. Welcome to both of you. Thank you very much, Thank you very much. Now, Raj, let me start with you. Um, looking at this contraction, it seems a lot of economists as well as analysts were surprised by this. Why the shock considering what we've seen the economy doing throughout last year, for example? I think, uh, first of all, I wasn't surprised. Uh, but a lot of surprise came because people were looking at the end of drought, agriculture is bouncing back, looking at commodities, uh, prices uh, stabilizing, mining doing very well. And as we can see, the results in, in those two sectors very well. However, the rest of the economy is contracting and some of them contracting very, very severely. For the first time, we see even our financial sector that even survived the Great Recession, it could not survive this time. So there was a lot of misreading of what we call it the leading indicators. And remember, this is only up to the end of March. We haven't seen the post-March and all the uh, credit downgrade effect. It will come in the second uh, quarter of the economy. So the economy is going through a very, very severe contractionary pressure. All of it, as you know, caused by a whole lot of political uncertainty. Now, speaking of those indicators that you've mentioned, I mean, some of the factors to consider when talking of the recession is the GDP figure. We look at the unemployment rate, financial markets, as you mentioned, saying that they are doing bad, as well as inflation. But I'd like to bring you in here, Mr. Vavi, where we now look at the unemployment rate. We saw the figures that were released by StatsSA last week, a 14-year high, 27% your take on that and what this means considering what we've seen today with the GDP data? Well, uh, we're not surprised too. I mean, all indicators uh, from our own practical experience as the representatives of workers, in particular in the manufacturing sector, mm -hmm. indicate that this economy is in deep, deep trouble. We have uh, said over and over that uh, South Africa is going through a massive, massive political and economic crisis. And the statistics uh, South Africa's report of uh, last week on unemployment rates just uh, underline the crisis South Africa is facing. I mean, this is a 13, 14 year, or 13, 14 year uh, uh, worst figures ever in the history of democracy, sitting now at 27 percent, narrow definition, 36.45 percent in a broader definition. Unfortunately, the statistics report of today that indicates that there is a shrinkage in the economy spells disaster for the second quarter of this year in both respect. We think that we're going to see more job losses in the, in the second quarter and we're going to see even greater levels of shrinkage in the economy. And that was something I wanted us to get into, saying looking forward, because this only shows, you know, the first part of the year, yeah. but we're already in June. I mean, it seems like the, the rest of the year is not going to look good. Let's look at some of the reasons why we're in the economic situation that we see ourselves in at this point in time. Miraj, you can go first. I think uh, if you look at the figures today, we'll see that the main driver of any growth in any economy is the, 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 the amount of investment. Investment in the first quarter of this year in comparison with last quarter of 2016, which was already low at 1.7%, declined from 17 to 1%. To just give you an idea of how much we need to create 3 to 4% growth, that we need to be about 30 to 35 percent. So we are way below just keeping the, the, the economy stable. 
So if you look into that, then we say, well, if your investment in the first quarter declined, then what can you expect in terms of job creation? What can you expect in terms of consumer spend? If unemployment goes up, what does it mean in real terms? It means now so many more people have got nothing to spend or they've got much less to spend. So many more people are dependent on those who are still got a job to do. So that means if we project the reality of the first quarter into the second quarter on the expenditure side, we're going to see more pressure on the retail, more pressure on services, more pressure on service sectors in broad, that's called tertiary sector. If you look at the manufacturing, leading indicators over the past couple of months, meaning in the second quarter, as Mr. Ravi mentioned, is that our manufacturing sector is under pressure. So if we look at what can be expected from Q2, of 2017, in all likelihood, we're going to see more pressure, and that is where the full impact of um, downgrade will come, which is caused purely by political uh, games that are being played. Another important factor, let's just stick to the manufacturing point, Mr. Vavi. We know that that sector is underperforming, and over the years we've seen mm -hmm. bailouts being given to the manufacturing sector. Um, there's a lot of talk about, you know, a lot of programs that government is putting in place, the Black Industrialist Program being mm -hmm. one of them. Why aren't we getting it right? We know we need to industrialize. We know we need the manufacturing sector to do well. But why is it continuously underperforming, considering the potential it has? A combination of two things, in my view. The problem is structural. And the reason why we're sitting with a structural crisis, which means that we are in a wrong growth path, which suggests that uh, South Africa's uh, economy is still reliant on, in the main, the mining, finance, and heavy chemicals, which means that we have not diversified our economy, which means we're still sitting with the old colonial and apartheid economy that serves the interest of a tiny minority and keeps the overwhelming majority of our people marginalized without property, without land. And therefore, this is inevitable in an economy where the economic activity is restrained to a number of people who keep on getting rich but who are smaller in number. And yet you have a situation where the majority of our people are trapped in unemployment, poverty, and inequalities. You're bound to have these things becoming a structural crisis going forward. So manufacturing, for example, we've just refused to industrialize the economy of South Africa. We're lazy. We have no political will, and our priorities are upside down. For example, if you look at the, headquarters, uh, at the, at the headlines of every newspaper, you see there that uh, we have all of our priorities upside down. Instead of us driving aggressively industrialization of South Africa, we're doing the opposite. The share, for example, of the manufacturing sector's contribution in the GDP in 1994 was sitting at around 22 percent. It's down to 13 percent around there now. That's a disaster for a, a country that wants to be a developing or developed nation in some future. That's the crux of the problem. The, there have been no redistribution of wealth. There have been no addressing of the land hunger or the part of the majority. And even when that crisis has been addressed, there have been no strategy to ensure that we move towards food security and food sovereignty. That's your crisis in South Africa. So as long as we have a political party that have completely looked at the other way in terms of historic mission, that is looking at the uh, factional battles towards the 2017 and consuming all of their time, including all of the nonsense we read about the Gupta leaks, we will still be here 30 years down the line. There's a lot going on in South Africa mm. at the moment. We see it every day, be it on social media, mainstream media. It's every day, and those are some of the things that you mentioned. And I want to look at the macroeconomics of this entire issue, um, which ties into investor uncertainty, which is something that you've mentioned, um, you know, is a big concern when it comes to where our economy is at the moment. Let's look at the politics around our country mm -hmm. and how it's affecting um, our economy overall. You can... I think uh, in, in, in a very brief terms, the politics in South Africa at the moment and over the past couple of years has effectively sabotaged economic stability, has sabotaged any confidence on the part of domestic and international investors. And there is no way other than just telling it as it is. 
whatever we want to achieve, if we want to achieve growth, if we want to achieve redistribution, if we want to achieve agro-processing, mining, manufacturing, whatever, you need to have a stability. We're talking about a lot of backlog. We're talking about uh, not only 28% or 36% unemployment, we have massive poverty. Now, these are not things that anybody can do it overnight. It requires what is called multi-generational consistent policies, meaning committing to something for 25, 30, 40 years in order to correct the backlog of the history. If you want to have that, for absolute sure, you must make sure that your politics is stays stable and focus on the right thing, not the stable and focus on the wrong thing. So not only we haven't focused on the right thing, we have every time that the economy got going, we sabotage it. The most recent one was in March. The South Africa Inc. unions, business and, and ministries on a roadshow, what happens? They get called back and the rest is history. So we cannot deal with our issues, promote investment, sustain growth in this type of political management. Something you spoke about are the socioeconomic issues that we face today. And I'm glad that you spoke about, you know, that it's a generational thing, that it's mm. not going to be overnight, Absolutely. that everyone is going to get the land that, that is owed to them, that they deserve. Mm. Not everybody's going to have jobs tomorrow, housing tomorrow, education tomorrow, etc. The policies are there. We've seen them. The policies aren't bad. Most experts and let's say the policies are there. So what are we doing wrong and what do we need to do? No, in my view, the policies are wrong altogether. Mm -hmm. We have not begun to address the legacy of colonialism and apartheid in South Africa. And the neoliberalism will put us where we are today and tomorrow and 20 years down the line. It will not change the structural deficiencies of the South African economy. Mm -hmm. But let me just raise other two, three other points in addition to what uh, uh, my leader is raising here. The first problem that we're facing in South Africa, I've already mentioned, the second one is that for the poor, we have been going through this hell forever. I mean, the, the South Africa's workers are going through their worst times, losing jobs, uh, being pushed into precarious forms of employment. The wages have been uh, kept low. The levels of expenditure per person by this government have been declining since 2009. And as we speak, they are way below zero in terms of uh, per, per person. And uh, that's your first crisis. The third uh, crisis in South Africa that we're facing is that there is just no prospect of growth. There's no vision. There's infighting in the ruling party. There is uh, uh, all manner of shenanigans that have nothing to do with prioritizing the interest of ordinary people. So if uh, Moody's uh, downgrade mm -hmm. South Africa at the end of this week, and I want to see whether uh, our minister will again say they will pick up the rent. Can they now pick up the GDP? Is right falling down 0.7%? It's a crisis. And that's the, one of the main reasons why we're here is the lack of political will to transform the economy. And secondly, is the, is, the, is the lack of will to implement even some of the better decisions they've taken over the past 23 years. Capacity. And the state capacity have been simply hollowed out mm -hmm. to the point that I don't think that uh, outside the maybe the treasury before uh, three months ago mm -hmm. have a capacity of, I mean, I mean I'm mean, i talking about technical capacity That's of right. people who can drive policy implementation processes. It's all been hollowed out because it's no longer very proud to work in the state. The intellectuals don't want to be associated with something that they see have no direction and is going nowhere. I'd actually like for us to touch on Treasury and, and the statement that they made mm -hmm. um, in reaction uh, to the GDP data. But before that, something that kept coming up today is, you know, recession versus technical recession. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I get a lot of the viewers actually, even on social media now, mm -hmm. tweeting me and saying, well, you know, what's the difference? Does a technical recession mean we're not really in a recession? So, Raj, I think this one would be a good one for you <laughs> to handle. Technical recession is just a defi definition. If you have two quarter back to back, minus growth, you are technically in recession. Actual recession is, I think, what Mr. Wahoo is talking about. Is a poverty out there, is joblessness. When you have unemployment of this level, even if you have growth, but if you have 30% unemployment, 20% unemployment, that's a recession. That's a recession for job seekers. That's a recession for, uh, for, for, for those who want to improve their standard of living. So I think these are the distinctions that they make. And of course, 
technical recession is important because if we don't pay attention, it's a signal. It's like a headache that you have. What does it mean? There's something in the system is wrong. That means it needs to focus the mind of the policymakers to avoid a third quarter or fourth quarter. The, the longer the recession takes, the deeper it gets because there isn't something to self-correct it. You need to intervene. And it's like a sick body. You've got to go to the doctor. You've got to take the right medicine and the body recovers. But if you just uh, leave it to itself, there is nothing that will self-correct. On top of it, if you then, uh, as uh, Mr. Wabi says, if you don't retract from what has caused the recession, if you keep doing more of the same thing, guess what? You'll get deeper and deeper into recession. Unemployment will go higher, poverty will get wider, and the time that it will take to come back will get much longer. Speaking of coming back, let's look at what National Treasury said. Um, and I want to quote some of what they said. Um, you know, they said, despite the GDP contraction, there are green shoots that South Africa can leverage on to boost its own economic growth outlook. And they mentioned some green shoots. What's your take on that statement, if you have seen it, and, and, and what they mean by these green shoots, for example? Mm -hmm. Is it a matter of just, this is what's happened right now, and we have to, to send something out because we're under pressure? Regrettably, the minister of finance and the deputy minister of finance cannot be trusted by any thinking south african today that's the crisis nobody trusts them maybe perhaps uh, only the black uh, business council will issue a statement to say that's give us hopes but any other thinking south african will not take that that even seriously because they are at the center of what uh, is said to be south africa's worst moment the gupterization of the economy, the domestication, hollowing out of the state institution, all of it meant to drive this country towards a kleptocratic capitalist order where there will be no accountability. If you look at what is being leaked out by the newspapers, the so-called uh, Gupta leaks, I mean, who, after reading that, will want to invest in the economy or listen to some minister saying that they are green offshoots, whatever he's talking about? The crisis in South Africa is that people have no confidence in the future. And it is demo demonstrated by the fact that business, for example, and I agree, disagree with them, they are sitting on a trillion rands investable cash that could take us out of the, of the hole. But how do you convince them when they read uh, the, 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 wiki, the, 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 the group Daleks? Impossible. Let's look at the sentiments that South Africans have. Because I think for me the most important thing is that somebody sitting at home, first of all, understands what this technical recession means, um, understands where we are right now as a country, you know, and what needs to be done going forward um, from the observation of trade unions, from the ob observation of economists, etc. You know, the ordinary South African is going through a lot of socioeconomic issues, be it poverty, be it a lack of education, be it, you know, unemployment. And we've seen it. We've seen the statistics statistics, we know that it's real. How should they be looking at this? Because yes, there's this newspapers and the Gupta issue um, and the leaks, etc. And the issue about white monopoly capital, which we hear about every single day. An ordinary South African is confused. Mm -hmm. There's a lot going yeah. on. Yeah. Iraj? Yeah, I think there is, a, um, there is a massive credibility issue here. We need to, for the sake of the national interest, and this is really a moment of taking care of the national interest and the welfare of the people, we need to close that credibility gap. We cannot have a situation where minister some says something, but nobody trusts it. President something, everybody laughs it out. Business makes a statement, somebody else laughs it out. Unions make a very credible statement, somebody else laughs it out. So we, we end up as a family, as a nation, end up in a situation that nobody trusts somebody else. So the sooner we close this credibility gap, the sooner we'll start sending a, a, a consistent message. We can disagree. Disagreement is part of democracy. But creating credibility crisis is not part of democracy and it's not good for national welfare. Mr. Bavi. I agree with the, with the last point. That's what I was emphasizing earlier. But I, I think that uh, South Africans are giving the guys in charge of the political system far too much power. We're sitting down. We're allowing them to destroy our future. We're seeing that every day. They're doing that now 
absolutely knowing that they will face no consequences. And I mean, if you read these uh, uh, leaks, Minister Mutambi should be sitting in a cell by now. The chairperson of the of the of uh, Dinel should be in a cell, but not in South Africa. And the main reason why they are not in a cell is because South Africans will not rise in unison to say we do not deserve this type of, of leadership. President Zuma doesn't deserve to be a president of the country. He should have long been forced by his own party, but his party is itself sewed up is part of the problem now, no longer they're part of the solution. I want to go back to something you mentioned earlier on about the policy, saying that the policies are, you know, are still driving colonialism, um, you, you know, what, what was happening then um, in terms of where our economy is, nothing has really changed. The government speaks a lot about the NDP and the potential it has to change things. Do you still think that the ambitious NDP still has um, the power to be able to drive the economy into the radical economic transformation that we, we hear about every single day? Not a chance. In my view, the radical economic transformation is just a mere rhetoric to try and mount, out maneuver a faction against another faction in the run up to the 27 ANC conference. There is no meaning and there's no uh, drive to ensure that it actually gets into, into play. As a reality of South Africans, we are now stuck with an economy that is their economy instead of us all saying that this is our economy. It's their land instead of us saying that this should be our land. It's their everything else. And that's how South Africa unfortunately have been divided by colonial past, the apartheid, and unfortunately those, those, uh, uh, those divisions are deepening. As we speak, and this is what is going to mean this, even though even the richest South African will have a sleepless night tonight, but the end result of it all is going to be that the rich few will continue to be rich and the poor majority will continue to be poor. And unfortunately, and that's why I'm, we're saying from SAFTU, the time to rise up against the status quo is now status quo at the level of the economy to dismantle the foundations of the colonial and apartheid economy, to dismantle the, up, the neoliberal uh, programs that have been implemented since 1995-1996, and to ensure that uh, we address the historic mission of the liberation in South Africa. And the historic mission was supposed to be redistribution of wealth, redistribution of land, of opportunities. It should have been about a, a better life for all. We're not moving towards a better life for all now. We're moving towards a better life for the Gupta family and their friends. Raj, we're in this recession yeah. right now. What can ordinary South Africans do, you know, to limit the impact, you know, in, in any way? Because the reality is this is where we are now. Um, going forward, yes, there are things we've spoken about now saying, you know, this is how we can take a stand, etc. But in terms of practical ways um, in your own home, in terms of your own pocket, mm. how can you limit that impact? I think there are a number of things on the expenditure side, um, wherever you can avoid um, getting debt or um, ad adding to your borrowing, you need to definitely pull back. Um, all the unnecessary expenditure and luxuries, uh, and, and luxury is a relative thing, I must emphasize. Um, those things need to be contained. And very importantly, look at opportunities that you can be productive, that you can be entrepreneurial. No matter how incremental, how small it is, in the tough times that are prevailing and in the time that may come, those additional entrepreneurial productive sources of income are going to help out. So I think losing hope is the last thing that we should do. We must be very careful not to get ourselves into, in the midst of all these political shenanigans, we cannot drive the, the nation into depression. Mm -hmm. That's the worst thing we can do because that will not serve the national interest. So I think that, that and this last thing which is very important is consultation and collective action. A lot of communities although they've been decimated, but there are a lot of collective activities that at communal level communities can do, neighborhoods can do, groups of friends can do, and all those things need to be explored. Because the macro picture is driven, sabotaged by the political situation, it will take time to stabilize. In the meantime, at the micro level, you and I and our families, we need to do whatever it takes to go forward. 
Mr. Bavi, the economy is not growing when we know that. And a huge issue now is that, you know, companies will be shedding jobs mm. um, and inflation is remaining relatively high, something that we mentioned a little bit earlier on. Should workers now stop demanding an increase in salaries and better working conditions? What does this mean for workers? Because they still need to be able to afford um, and, and, and they still need what they need. They still want and, and demand a living wage and we're not there yet. So what should the workers be focusing on and doing um, with the economy looking as it looks right now? I think that uh, the trade union movement in South Africa must unite those that are truly independent, that wants to struggle against the status quo and dismantle the status quo, the colonial and apartheid economy. Mm. That's the first thing that we must do. But I think we're going to be under lots of pressure, I must admit. I, mean, for, I was looking at the news that engineering sector, uh, organized mainly by NUMSA, is going on negotiations now in June. It's going to be difficult. Very difficult because in the real is that uh, the, manu the steel industry in particular, yeah. thanks to the government uh, misguided uh, trade policies, is going through hell. We're losing jobs left, right and centre. Big companies have closed down. So when that happens, unfortunately, let, go, let me go back to my theory. The poor suddenly is being asked to moderate their demands, mm -hmm. meaning to remain poor and the rich will remain richer we need to wrap up now but just a final word from mm. from both of you just in terms of perhaps for you a prediction i know you mentioned mm. earlier on in terms of you know the kind of economic growth we need to see in order to create those jobs but going forward what can we expect to see for the rest of the year also keeping in mind um what's happening uh with the w with the policy conference of the anc um later this month but also the elective conference at the end of the year I think all of those are f further fuel into the flame of instability. So prospects are not that great because those who should be focusing on stabilizing the, the economy, uh, promoting growth, they are playing different games. They are after their own positions. So they're not going to focus and we see the ministers are sidetracked. The party is even more sidetracked. So uh, what needs to be done somehow and maybe this is a moment for unions and the business to say, well, politicians have lost their ways. Can they come together and promote investment whilst the politicians are fighting? And that's unfortunately is a very unusual situation because government has abdicated its responsibility. A final word from you, Mr. Bavi. Our people are fast losing hope. If you look at the local government elections, 20, 21 million. But how do we get them, I mean, give them hope? We, we've got to get them to believe that they can change things. And that's our key message tonight. Mm -hmm. You can fight for a different direction than the one that we are being led down to at this moment. If we mobilize instead of moaning all the time and doing nothing about the status quo. Well, gentlemen, we'll have to leave it there. It's been a great and insightful discussion. Thank you very Thank much you. for joining us. Thank you very much. That was economist Dr. Raj Abedian and soft to General Secretary Zwilinzi Mavavi joining us to speak about that GDP data that was released earlier on today. Many discussions on the unemployment rate as well as the politics that we see playing out in South Africa. More news for you after the break. Stay with us.